you. Welcome to Frontiers of Brain Health. This is where we bring the most cutting edge research in brain health and what you can do to promote your brain so that your best brain year will be next year. My name is Dr. Sandy Chapman. I'm the founder and chief director of the Center for Brain Health and I'm a professor at the University of Texas at Dallas. For those of you that are online, this is virtual, so please, there will be some time after the presentation to ask questions, use the Q&A, but we want the audience to ask questions, so write, jot down your questions and let's have a very engaging interaction after we hear from our speaker. For those of you that don't know much about the Center for Brain Health, we hope this is just the first of many engagements that you do, because this is one of the only centers in the world that's focused on increasing brain performance whatever age you are. It is my distinct privilege to get to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Andrew Nevin. He's an entrepreneur. <coughs> He's an economist, a strategist, and a global citizen. He's a key advocate for advancement of economies and quality of life. Well, guess what? Brain health combines both of those. As the inaugural director of the Brainomics Venture, he is positioning the Center for Brain Health as the global authority on the economics of brain health. Just to hear his background, you will know why we are lucky and he is just the right pick to lead this amazing endeavor. Dr. Nevin is just back from 15 years in Nigeria, uh, from uh, being there where he was a nation builder and public intellectual. As the partner of PwC Nigeria, he was the financial services leader and chief engagement economist and served on the boards of many leading NGOs. He brings 35 years of experience in a wide variety of roles. Line manager, strategy consultant, investor, economist, entrepreneur, author, and again, public intellectual. He's built up such an amazing group of people, and he was he's very interested in the concept of flourishing, what it means to flourish. So using all of these skills, he's lived his life in Africa, in Asia, in North America, and now we're fortunate to have him here. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrew Nevin. Such a kind introduction, Prof. Sandy. Thank you so much. That's too kind on that. And thank you all for coming here today. It's just a real honor. Jeremy, can people hear me? Sound okay? All right, so thank you so much. So for those of you who don't know me, I have just uh, moved, as uh, Prof. Sandy said, from um, Africa to Texas. I am uh, delighted to be here. My wife, Uma, and I, we're really privileged to be in Texas, very excited about it, just getting settled on it. And I've come here to help the center with the idea of brainomics. So today, I have obviously, like always, we bring a few slides. But my main purpose is introducing brainomics, but really pushing the boundaries of some provocative thinking about that. So everyone can use their brain thinking about the economics of, um, of, uh, of brain health. So, so let's get started on that. Looking forward to a r robust discussion afterwards on it. And uh, let me just start out by defining it. So what is brainomics? Well, I think most people who are associated with the Center for Brain Health know that Sandy coined the term brain health 25 years ago. It's a registered trademark of the Center for Brain Health. A decade ago, Sandy coined the term uh, brainomics, which is really about the, the brainomics, uh, sort of the economics of brain health, particularly the economics of interventions, because I mean, I'm sure many of you have seen headlines where you say it's $300 billion, the cost of Alzheimer's, $300 billion, the cost of depression. That's important work, but it's not necessarily that helpful until you understand what you can do to intervene that has that economic impact. Now, why do we need uh, brainomics? I, I mean, we're in a, a center for brain health. We're in a neuroscience center. There's 120 neuroscientists in this center. There's 1.5 uh, brainomics people, and that's probably about the right ratio on that, 100 to 1. The brainomics is a little bit of extra, so people understand, who, people who are not necessarily convinced by the, the science of it, about improving people's lives, improving flourishing, they can also see that there's an economic argument for that. And just, I said there's one and a half people. I'm the one people. I'd just like to introduce 
Sharon, please stand up, Sharon. Sharon, please give her a big hand. So Sharon is the, is the halftime RA for, for Brainomics. She's based at UT Dallas up in the EPPS. We're very privileged to have her. And if there's anything interesting that comes out of today's talk, it's all due to Sharon, not to me. So there we go. <laughs> Of course, you know, why are we doing it now? I mean, I think some of these things, you know, we all really understand on that. Um, and I'll show you a chart in a minute with some numbers, because economists bring numbers on that. But we need to have longer productive lives if this economy is going to function. And we need to thrive in a knowledge economy. Um, and as I said before, people are still moved by these economic measures. I'm, I have to say I am embarrassed by being an economist. Uh, so I studied originally mathematics and computer science. And I said to myself, I don't know much about the world. What could I go study? and understand more about the world. And I wish at the time I had chosen neuroscience, but I wasn't smart enough, so I chose uh, economics. Economics will teach me about, uh, about how the world works. Sadly, I found out that wasn't, that wasn't true. And I'm embarrassed that people are moved by economic measures, but we still need these economic measures to be able to drive through what we want in terms of improving brain health. But the biggest thing, as I said before, is the interventions, because we can actually do something about it. I mean, if we had the 300 billion number for depression, you can't do anything about it. It's not very interesting. The reason brainomics is so important now is because the work the Center for Brain Health has done, and, and others, but particularly this center, in having the interventions that we can actually move the needle and we can show the economic impact. Now, I promised a few numbers, just and there'll be more numbers through this presentation uh, on that, but just I thought to get started, one of the things that's happening in, the, in the, this country, and this is all US data, is that the age group of people 25 to 54 is basically flat. So you can see from over a 30 year period, there's less than 10% movement in that, which is less than 0.3% per year movement in population of that age group. But of course, the population in the 55 to 74 year old group has almost doubled in that present time. So, so simply from an economic viewpoint, to have a robust economy, you need the people in the 55 to 74 year old age group to be as economically productive as the ones who are in the 25 to 54 year old age group, which is one of the reasons why brain health is so important to extend the working life. Let me skip a few slides on that. But w the other thing we're finding though is the corporate people are co starting to recognize the economic benefits of it. So this is one of the clients that we have a published paper. This is not disclosing client confidentiality. This is a, uh, a national uh, architectural firm that's based here in Dallas that we've worked with for a number of years. And this is one of the quotes from the leader there about the importance of brain health at this time on that. So people are starting to see these concepts like brainomics, concepts like brain capital, the impact of brain health in terms of productivity, attrition, engagement, creativity is really starting to become apparent to the business community. Okay, so when we say brainomics, it's important to remember that we're talking about at least three levels of economic impact. There's the impact for an individual, so someone that has, has a, a better brain health, stronger brain health, is going to have an impact on their lifetime earnings. It's going to have an impact on how long they are able to function in the workforce. It's going to have an impact on their health care costs and other impacts as well on, on that. So it happens at an individual level. But it also happens at a firm level. So if you have a stronger brain health in a firm, you're going to have uh, higher productivity, lower absenteeism, lower attrition, and lower health care costs. But of course, it also works at the uh, society level. So this is, of course, the overall productivity, how long people participate in the workforce, and the health care costs. And the brainomics venture that we're doing here, we want to be the leader in all three of these areas and connect up. I mean, obviously, if an individual has stronger brain health and it results in uh, higher lifetime earnings, that also has an impact overall on the society's economics. Now, at the center, of course, we've had various intervention programs. One of the flagship programs is the Adolescent Reasoning Initiative, which has reached almost 100,000 young people focused on cognitive uh, capabilities uh, around adolescence and, and middle school uh, on that. And the way, and of course, I, I don't know if Dr. Jackie, Prof. Jackie's here today, but he, her and her team have done an amazing job over the last decade um, in driving this program through, of having an incredible impact on the world. And they express the impact through these sorts of metrics on that. So these are metrics around the neuroscience functioning, so an improvement in executive functioning, a decrease in anxiety and depressive symptoms, and an increase in academic strength. So that is what we've done to date. 
But why brainomics? Because brainomics adds, as I said, that extra 1% that then translates this impact into some economic metrics. So if we take the adolescent, adolescent reasoning initiative, we're going to have an impact at the society level. So increased average productivity, reduced healthcare costs, uh, improved workforce, higher participation, but also at the individual level, better outcomes, better earnings over the. So, so the, as I said before, this 1% is an add-on that takes the impact that we've had on brain health from the interventions and then ties it together with the economic output. Now, of course, I haven't put any numbers here because I just arrived on October 1st, so I don't have the numbers yet. But what we're doing is we're working with each of the intervention programs of the Center for Brain Health, so ARI, Charisma, uh, programs with communities, programs with colleges, our, our Brain Healthy Workplace, Brain Health uh, Project, all of them are now going to start to have uh, the brainomics measured within them. So I hope over the next few, the next time I speak to you, I'll have some, some numbers. But I still have some provocative things to say, even though I've only been here a month and a half. I'm now, what sorts of topics are we going to cover? So as I said, we're going to be looking at the brainomics of our own interventions. But you know, Sandy coined the term, we want to be the global leader in brainomics. And we want to stretch people's thinking about the economics of brain health, the economics of the brain. So if I said that to you, you'd say, OK, so what are the issues that you might look at? So these are some of the issues that would come to your mind. So obviously, I talked a little bit before about demographics, aging workforce, how do you keep people brain healthy if they can work longer, participation rates. You've got the normal things like Alzheimer's, depression, excess stress, burnout, addiction. All of these things, you'd say, OK, Andrew, I get that. That's obvious. Go ahead and do that. But as I said, we really want to stretch the world's thinking about brainomics. So we are looking also at some things that you might think are a little bit more innovative. So gratitude. What's the economics of gratitude? Has anyone ever heard economics and gratitude put in the same sentence before together? What's the economics? Uh, Sandy mentioned that I'm very interested in flourishing, but whether it's happiness, pneumonia, what's the economics of flourishing on there? What's the economics that come from agency sense of control? So one of the best things you can do for your brain health is when you have a sense of control. There's a relationship the neuroscientists have taught me between sense of control and your brain health. But what's the economics of that? Social and emotional learning on that. Social media and devices, grit on that. So our objective to be the leader in brainomics is not just to touch on the obvious ones, but to extend people's thinking to really be a little bit innovative about that. Uh, and to do that, the primary way we're going to start doing that is something called the brainomics bulletins. So these are bite-sized little pieces, three, four, two, three, four pages. Stephanie's here. She's telling me two pages, not four pages. <laughs> Based on academic research, but very accessible to wide audiences. And we're going to go through these different topics and try to stretch people's thinking. So we have four bulletins that we're working on right now. We hope to put the first one out uh, just after Thanksgiving on that. And the first one is on gratitude. So I want to share with you a little bit of the, the results in our thinking, what we're finding about the economics of gratitude, uh, and build up over the four. So as you said, what is economics of gratitude? Well, it turns out we actually know quite a lot about the economics of gratitude. What we know from the academic literature is that actually there's a crisis of engagement. You know, I hope everyone who comes to work at the Center for Brain Health, I'm very engaged. I'm new. You're always engaged when you're new. Uh, but also, I'm very excited about my work. I feel I have a sense of purpose. But you all know that doing, have, being engaged is a critical success factor for doing a good job at work. But 70% of the employees in the US have a lack of engagement. 65% of employees say that we're not recognized even once in the last year, which is extraordinary to me uh, on that. But the, you would go through your work life without having recognition for what you've contributed to that. 18% is the average annual turnover in the United States. Now, how do you start to connect the economics to these numbers? Well, it turns out to replace an employee is very expensive. So sometimes you might think 20, 30% of the cost. Actually, there's some estimates that it's three to four times the annual cost, which is, sounds extraordinary. But if you take all the costs of the productivity loss when there's no employee, of the search costs, of all the people involved in the hiring decision, of onboarding them, the loss of productivity while they come up to speed, the hiring mistakes that you make and have to replace them in a few months. And some estimates say three to four times annual salary. So if you take, um, and the last number here, 79% of employees that quit uh, say that lack of appreciation was a major reason for leaving. So now you can start to connect up the economics. So no one's ever coined the term brainomics. 
But it turns out if you look at the literature, there are little pockets of evidence that we can start to piece together because people really want to know, you know how does it fit all together. So if we've got 18% uh, annual turnover, if a new hire, even if it only costs one time annual salary, and 79% of people say that one reason for quitting was a lack of appreciation for it, you can start to piece together the economic cost of not having enough gratitude in the workplace. And what's, uh, but we don't kind of know yet whether there's a, a complete ROI. So that's one of the things we're going to try to figure out here. But the thing about gratitude from an economic viewpoint is it's free. I mean, we know the neuroscience, and I haven't discussed any neuroscience here because I'm in a neuroscience center, so. But, but everyone here understands you can give gratitude for free, and the impact of both giving gratitude and receiving gratitude on the brain health is, is enormous. So, so it's a very strange economic paradox. You have something that's free, and people don't do very much of it. And it turns out that the higher up you get, the less grateful you are which was a very disappointing result on that. So, so this is one, this will be our first bulletin we're putting out, I hope, before, just to get people thinking about that. So, so that's a positive story. But we also have the negative stories of, um, of, of brainomics on that. So this is one we'll put out as, I think, our second or third bulletin. This talks about the, um, not the level of major depressive episodes in young women, just the increase. So the increase, is about from 11% to 23% between 2013 and 2023. And we won't speculate if the reason for this is social media. That is just the increase, this 12% increase in that, which means that there's 270,000 more depressed young women now than there would have been 10 years ago uh, on that. Now, can we translate that into economic numbers? Well, it turns out that someone's done a study on this, which tur it turns out that the, um, your employment, the number of people employed reduces by 5% and your average earnings are reduced by 15%. So we can translate that through to economic numbers. The, the loss for one single year for one cohort is $1.5 billion. Now we don't know how long it lasts. If it lasts only 10 years, that's a $15 billion loss from the cohort. But maybe it lasts a lifetime because of these I implications around confidence and you may fall further behind on that. So the aggregate loss, we don't know on that. But you know, very sobering numbers on that. Labor force participation. This is one of the most critical economic numbers, and I can tell you, as we come into uh, continue with this aging aging population, absolutely critical on that. So we've seen a decline in the U.S. labor force participation over the past two decades. Uh, the U.S. is only 78 percent, uh, which is lower than many OECD countries, lower than the OECD average. You can see Germany, Netherlands, Iceland. I mean, maybe their labor force participation will decline because one of their towns is about to be destroyed by a volcano, but uh, doing much better than us on that. On that. So, and of course, you know, we haven't yet pieced together exactly one of the, the difference between why the U.S. is different than, than these other countries, but I think there's a strong hypothesis that one reason is the brain health challenges that are particularly acute in the United States. So stress levels depression among uh, U.S. adults on, on that. And of course, we do know that more employees are quitting because of brain health challenges. So this is brainomics on there. Now you might say, is there anything we can do about it? Well, it turns out there is a country that's done something about it, which we thought was very interesting. And this, uh, I'll give all credit to, to Sharon. She found this article in Swedish. We then use Google Trans, which, you know, again, as I said, there's lots of nuggets out there about brainomics that are not being pieced together. So you have this a set of literature in Swedish, which Sharon went and found out. We had translated and then kind of read it, read it in English on there. It turns out there is a country that really has addressed this issue. So in 2013, Sweden had faced similar issue with the United States with a declining labor force participation. And they, they used the term mental health. Of course, at the Center for Brain Health, we don't use the term mental health. But they used the term mental health, and they said it was a leading cause of people dropping out of the labor force and it was also accounting for the majority of disability claims. So they decided that they would, they would do something about it uh, on that. So they had a new he mental health strategy. But the thing I think that's really interesting for us here at the Center for Brain Health was they used the term mental health, but they extended it to say it's for the entire population. And you know, when I stand up and try to explain my little role in brainomics about the Center for Brain Health, what I say is the most important thing about the Center for Brain Health is concerned with the brain health for the entire population, not for people who currently have brain health challenges or mental illness, if we use that term. So the Swedes came to the same idea and designed a strategy around addressing 
I'll use the term brain health, brain health challenges, brain health through the whole population. And what's been the impact of it? Well, they've got their labor force participation back up. They've got 89.3, which I think is higher than the number I just showed you for Iceland, so back up to the top of the OECD table. Uh, they've had the fastest recovery in labor force participation after COVID on that. So this was really heartening to us because it's, it's somewhat at a national, not a big country, small country, beautiful country, uh, but, but who, who've come to the same conclusion that you need to think about brain health across the whole population and have done something about it. So we'll be writing a bulletin about that to get people to be people thinking. Uh, the fourth bulletin, in fact, we'll have to write many bulletins about it. I said I would say something provocative about that. So if you, how many people here studied economics at uh, university? At one course, I don't mean studied economics, I mean one took one course. One course, so most people took. <laughs> Sorry, in the US, I'm not, I'm not American. In the US they call it like uh, Econ 100 or something, is that right? Yeah. Not, okay, so. <laughs> So do you remember your Econ 100 professor, I mean, first they talk about marginal utility theor theory and one beer is like uh, good, and two beers may be better and then <laughs> after a while it sort of drops off <laughs> on the curve. Do you remember all of that? On that? I mean, the other thing about economics, and of course now that you're in a neuroscience center, you think back to what your economics professor said about the way people uh, you know, actually behave, it just, it's just completely absurd on that. Um, but you also probably remember back that, I mean, there's a basic um, premise in economics that if someone demands something, it's good for the individual. I mean, that's what marginal utility theory, economic utility theory is all about. So you have business models that emerge and you have consumer demands that match the business models and people are better off, more choice is better. Does people remember that from the Econ 100? Okay. But what actually happens in practice? I mean, we're sitting here in a neuroscience center. So you know, I've used the term here, business models that weaponize the brain. So these are the business models that use the brain against itself on that. So, I mean, the obvious one is social media. How many people here read about three weeks ago, 33 states have filed suit against uh, Meta because of the damage that they're, they're causing on that. So if you think about it, it's a little bit like the um, natural capital. We have a stock of brain capital and you, uh, to take the, the natural capital, you might have a business model where someone produces an economic profit, but they do it at the destruction of the environment, right? So the net effect to society is you, the society is worse off, but the, pro the profits are being privatized, right? And of course, it's the same thing that happened in the great financial uh, crisis of 2008. Uh, you had people who made money financially, and I know this because this is what I did at PwC back then, study the financial crisis. You have people that have private profits and you socialize their losses, right? So what's happening in this business model? Well, what the states are saying essentially is you have Meta who have privatized the profits from the business model, but they've socialized the losses on that. So the, the net effect of this business model is negative for society, but it's being borne by the individual and by the economy as a whole and society as a whole on that. Gambling. Uh, and I'll speak in the UK, I've lived in the UK for, well, it's really my, my home base um, for a long time. I'm not quite sure how it works in the United States, but the, the richest woman in England, in the United Kingdom, is the woman that owns a company called Bet365. And she's absolutely brilliant. Uh, she made, I think last time I saw, she made 465 million pounds in one year. So over $500 million, over $600 million in one year, because she owns 90% of Bet365. She's a mathematician, she was trained at Oxford. She created this, you know, she, her family had a betting company and then she created the online platform for it. And it, all the foot uh, soccer that you watch, I mean, it's all the betting companies. Now there's this belief out there that says that really what's happening is punters are going, people are betting small amounts of money and you know, they're having a good time. I mean, I had a Bet365 account. I managed to keep 100 pounds, lasted for about a year. You know, I'm not addicted to gambling on that. And the, the profits are basically made from that group. Well, it turns out that's actually not how the business model works. It turns out the profits are made from about 5% of the people who are addicted gamblers, who are betting more than they can, they can afford at a time. It affects, I mean, suicide, mental health, family relations, and all of that. So this is a business model where, again, you've socialized the losses from the business model. 
privatize the gains. I said, I, you know, I don't want to be critical of this woman. She's brilliant. But the, inherently, the business model is, again, one of those that weaponizes the brain against itself. And I don't know. I think betting is relatively new in the United States, this online legalization of it, uh, on that. So we'll see if it doesn't. And, of course, another example is the online uh, mobile gaming, similar kind of dopamine hits that uh, my friend, my dear friend, Professor Ian Robertson, talks about it. So I think that one of the things that Brainomics that we'd like to explore is just you know, this relationship between these business models and weaponization of the brain and who bears the losses versus who gains the profits from it. And I think, I think we'll find some very interesting and disturbing results from that. Of course, there's other business models that weaponize, not weaponize, that damage the brain. And I say this, I mean, uh, oh. San, Sandy you know, was very kind reading out my biography. So I've spent 36 years in the private sector. I spent 22 of those 36 years at two major consulting firms, which I won't name here uh, on that. Um, but if you think of these business models, consulting, Silicon Valley, investment banking, law firms, trading desks, these are really business models that damage the brain because you've got chronic stress, anxiety. I mean, any time you interview people at trading desks, so these are people who you know, trade commodities, stocks, and bonds, they all want to be out by 40 because it's so horrible, right? If you're mm -hmm. still there at 45, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna survive. But you can notice that I've deliberately used the word weaponized versus uh, damage. And you know, I don't know if this terminology is correct. We'll have to explore this at Center for Brain Health, see if we use it. But the reason that we, that Cher and I chose this was we thought of weaponizing the brain, the business models that weaponize the brain are in a sense more damaging because the people that are, whose brains are being weaponized against them don't have the same agency. They have a limited capacity to avoid it uh, on their limited autonomy on that. Whereas the ones that damage the brain, like joining a consulting firm, I mean, when I joined a consulting firm that I won't name, it's completely voluntary. You're kind of older when you do that. So a little bit of a distinction. Uh, but one question you can really ask yourself is, you know, maybe all business models damage the brain at a certain level uh, on that. So, so we'll be exploring this as part of brainomics uh, on that. So as I said, I bring some provocative hypotheses. I think weaponizing and damaging business models are pretty provocative. Okay, so that's a bit of a negative story. But I don't want to leave, end on a negative story. I want to end on a very positive story. I mean, I've joined the Center for Brain Health because I think that, uh, as Prof. Sandy says, we can affect 8 billion people on this planet uh, in a positive way on it. Um, so some of the things I think that are coming out from, from brain health and brainomics is it really is going to become a battleground for an edge uh, on there, competitive battleground. And I think this battleground is going to be at least at two levels. One level is between companies on it. So we'll come to that in a moment. But the second one is between nations. Uh, I skipped over one slide before, but there was a geopolitical rivalry that we're all aware of in the world right now. And one of the key dimensions of this is going to be the brain health of the population. And you saw the quote in the movie which says the biggest um, risk factor in the United States is K-12. to If you don't have a brain healthy population at K-12, to if you don't have a brain healthy adult population, very difficult to keep your competitive edge. Business models that consume brain capital will fail. So we just talked about uh, Meta being sued by 33 states. Apparently, more states are preparing their lawsuits against Meta. I think that this um, I idea that you can design a business model that consumes brain capital will become less and less viable in the future. So I mean, we've, you, many of you are not old enough, but we went through all the battles with tobacco. You know, we're going through other battles where things that have damaged society as a whole are no longer allowed. And I think that the time is coming, and this meta is kind of the first salvo on that meta lawsuit is that. Um, the third thing that I think Brainomics is going to show, which is very critical for the, for the um, uh, Center for Brain Health, is that by far the best Brainomics is going to come from what the Center for Brain Health that does, which is work with people before they're, while they're still left of boom. So everyone who's associated with the Center for Brain Health understands the concept of left of boom. You should do something before you hit time time B or time boom uh, on that. And the brainomics is going to show that by a factor of 10 to 1, 100 to 1. If you intervene from an economic viewpoint at the point where someone has a mental health challenge, where someone has depression, where someone has burnout, the economic impact is going to be, I, I don't want to say it's not worth doing from an economic viewpoint. It's probably worth doing, but you're not going to really get a payoff. From an economic viewpoint, if you intervene, if you strengthen brain health before the boom moment, 
The payoff is going to be 50 to 1, 100 to 1. I think our adolescent reasoning initiative, I'm going to come out now, say Dr. Jackie and her team, I think it's going to show an uh, economic impact of 500 to 1 at a minimum on that, working before uh, we've hit the boom point on that. Um, so all of this kind of leads us to the viewpoint that from, and we've got our little registered trademarks uh, on there, you know, brainomics has to be a priority. It's part of the story of the Center for, for Brain Health, of our focus on, on building healthy brains across the lifespan. And we're going to be able to show that each of these interventions uh, that we do here and, and other people's interventions in the same light really have a dramatic economic impact um, uh, at the individual level, at the corporate level, at the society level um, on that. So, so just to, to, to summarize all that and, and stop and take any questions, and I hope it's been provocative enough on that. So I said, I don't have enough data. I'm desperate to get data on that. So that instead of data, I've made hypotheses at this stage on that. So, so the first bold hypothesis is I, I actually think that from an economic viewpoint, whether you're a society, whether you're a corporation, whether you're an individual, the biggest economic payoff is going to turn out investing in, in, in brain health, and particularly ha healthy brains before there's a challenge on that. That's going to be the biggest payoff. So the biggest, as I said before, it's before there's a problem left of boom in Sandy's terms on that. So. The third hypothesis here is that the greatest benefits are going to come from uh, all three levels in society working together. And if you think about some of our interventions, like the B Brain Health Project, I mean, it's fantastic. An individual can go and they can, they can improve their brain health, they can perform their work better, et cetera. But what works really well is if the individual is doing that, at the same time the corporation's thinking of the same thing. I think that you're going to find that the payoff from having the levels work together is extraordinary. Uh, the fourth hypothesis is that you know, more and more we're going to be designing all of our systems around how the brain works. You know, I go back to what I said before about economists being, I, I don't even have a word for the way they think about people make decision making, but they're obviously not in integrating the way the brain works into anything. In I mean, we're integrating it. That's why we call it brainomics on that. Um, but I think that all as aspects of human society are going to start to be, there's going to be thinking about how does work need to be designed, how do spaces need to be designed, to, how do systems need to be designed to fit in with how the brain actually works. And the fifth hypothesis is the biggest challenge is always is going to be how do we make it sticky. So if you think about some of the interventions, particularly in the corporate side of the Center for Brain Health, how do you get people to make the time? How do you, because people think it's one more task on that. I think we'll find solutions for it um, on there. And I think brainomics is part of the solution, of course, because if we can convince corporations that there's a payoff from investing in brain health, you know, they'll also support making sure their people find the time and find the resources to be able to invest in brain health. So, so let me pause there. Uh, I think we've, we've talked enough. I'd like to hear from, from others on there, but just to, you know, summarize all this, you know, brainomics is, is really uh, a small sliver of what we're trying to do here at the Center for Brain Health, but I'd like to think it's an important sliver because there's still a group of people out there that need the economic metrics. You know, we're working very hard to build out the economic metrics for our own interventions, but we're also going to be global leaders in the thinking about brainomics and some of the provocative <laughs> topics, and particularly this one about business models that weaponize the brain and damage the brain. So let me pause there and uh, take questions or comments from anyone. Great. Thank you so much. I bet each of you are thinking about what economic metric we could start to collect, so we want to know that. So what questions do you have, Marlene? There was an article, or an, uh, I'm sorry, a magazine that was published recently within the last few weeks on the 100 best companies in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And there was a common thread among them, whether they were law, restaurants, construction, whatever. They felt like a family. The people said that they could make suggestions and they were heard and implemented. There, were, there is a huge cohort of people here in Dallas that may be helpful for your study on measuring how they do it because they are successful and, and one of them is Brinker. And I worked with Brinker Company in the 80s 
and they were fabulous. They had games, they had fun, they, all the employees got along. It was a marvelous workspace, and it still is today. You know, I, I, I agree. In fact, I mean, this, this is the fu fundamental issue is, is, I mean, in a way we know, we know from many of these studies the best companies to work for, the things that you need to do to have a successful company, and yet there's so many companies that don't do it, right? And so you think, I mean, this is where I think economists have really failed us because uh, economists would come along and say, well, the market's going to work it out, and if he were better off running it in a certain way and showing some gratitude, only the companies that show gratitude would survive. But that's not what's happened in practice. What's happened in practice is you have a small number, 100 companies that are doing these things. You have 10,000 companies that are not doing these things and are operating in a way that damages the brain on that. So. But I think as a, as a tool for research, it would be fantastic. I'm, I'm sure we would find you know, all these common threads that the, the, the way that work is organized actually fits in with the way the brain works, that they have brain healthy workplaces without Stephen having to go and introduce it to them, that they show gratitude in the workplace. I'm sure that's what we'll find out when we do the research. Yeah, and I'd just like to add now that we can actually measure some of the things that are getting better because we want it not to just be static, we're happy, but are you happier year by year? So we can help them measure that and see how much they've gained. So it's, it's going to be a very exciting part, Steve. Thank you. So I'm going to cheat and ask a two-part question. In the first part, maybe Sharon will be better able to answer. Did Sweden, did that study document the cost of this movement? And have they begun to try to anticipate what that return on investment is, given the, the data we saw? Sharon, do you have a uh, So their, their strategy was 2015 to 2020, and then from 2020, there was a COVID. So they were to measure in 2020, but they could not do it. So they, they are planning to do uh, another strategy for three years and then measure it now. And lastly, since you and I both spent time in the, for me, Cooper's and I ran for you, PWC, have they really thought about quantifying the cost they have in the dramatic turnover model that they built over time? Do you, what do you see as the possibility of changing the huge momentum behind that business model? No, I, th I, I, th I mean, uh I, you know, we continue to have in the consulting profession massive turnover, right? I don't think there's been any, and I, and I think people in a way, you know, accept it as a, a given. Um, but I, I think it can change rapidly. I mean, I think there's more willingness to, to think about these things. I just don't think we've given them the tools yet for the Center for Brain Health to show the mathematics. I mean, we want to do that, right, on that. But, um, yeah, the, the turnover model is, is is not, uh, is, I don't think will be viable in the future, that, that rapid turnover in those, those firms. I have a question. In the uh, high stress jobs that you mentioned, I noticed that healthcare is not on it. And uh, there are a lot of nurses and doctors that are burnt out and leaving the workforce at a time when people are getting older and will need that kind of care. I don't know if there was a. Yeah, it's just an. It, should, it probably should be at the top. Uh, is the healthcare? Is the, I mean, the care, care workers, doctors, nurses, all the people in the healthcare profession. It's. It, it is also not designed to be consistent with uh, great health. So, um, it's interesting that the the consultant um, business model, to whatever extent, relies on the constant influx of new young professionals and we know that a lot of um, a lot of countries a lot of societies are, are graying at this point um, so I think that that might fall just by its own weight yeah so I just to go back to this concept of brain capital so we, we I didn't talk much about it but I think it'll be an increasingly important concept in in this discussion and in brain brainomics in general so your know, brain capital is like physical physical capital natural capital etc and we have a certain amount of brain capital. So I, what I would say about the, the business consulting model is it consumes brain capital. So you know, over time, I think that model will be less and less uh, viable because it takes, you know, you have this brilliant young person, you give them a little bit of training, you get you know, one to six years out of them working very long hours, very stressful, 
and then you've, 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 you've created profits for the partners, just to be very blunt about it, the way it works on that. And then you've, you've you, this shriveled up hunk of the, the person that you consume, the brain capital goes on to something else and hopefully recovers and you know, has, a, has a good career. But the model consumes brain capital. And of course, if you have less and less young people, it's a, then it becomes a less and less viable model because you don't have so much brain capital to consume. Thank you for the um, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, my question is one of reality. I think I always ask the real questions. Um, work, education, urban design, and other areas. And you spoke about the fact that this needs to be done before the crisis comes. We're living in an environment, um, certainly in this state, in which we're burning. You know, we're censuring librarians. We're censuring books. We are um, not increasing the um, curriculum for um, local students K through 12. Uh, how do we um, get to invest in that population, which um, Raven speaks of so eloquently as being the most important, um, without getting involved in the political aspects of it? Well, I'm new to Texas, so I, you know, it's hard for me to comment on the political aspects. So I, what, what I will say is from the Center for Brain Health's perspective, if you, again, if you take ARI, so the, as I said, I, my hypothesis is when we do the economics of ARI, so the Adolescent Reasoning Initiative, we'll find out the payoffs are 500 to 1, 1,000 to 1 on that. I mean, it costs $200 per student to do the ARI program. It's reached about 90,000 students. Uh, if a student does it two or three, Times, you know, I think the hypothesis is probably pretty locked in. So you're talking about a few hundred dollars that has major impact on graduation rates, on their ability to be employed, et cetera. So I think the, the role that brainomics plays in this is if we can show some of these economics, it becomes easier for political decision makers to kind of get behind some of these programs. But I mean, if we're really, if we look versus certainly when I was young, which was 40 years ago and 30 years ago, 20 years ago, there has been massive progress. The awareness of these issues, the awareness of mental health challenges. I mean, all the work that Sandy and everyone here at the center has done to now think more about brain health. I mean, it's easy to be um, cynical about, about where we're at, but I mean, I think from where I stand, there's been a lot of progress on that. And I hope we, the Center for Brain Health and a little bit the Brainomics can continue to kind of make that progress and get, get everyone behind having healthier brains. I think one thing I haven't said before uh, today is I think that one of the things Brainomics needs to do is help build out a Brainomics index. So for example, the state of Texas, if you're a policymaker, it's useful for you to have some kind of, you know, Sandy comes along and talks to the legislature and they say that's all very interesting, but how do we measure the state of brain capital or the state of brain health, the state of the brainomics for our state? So if we can help develop some metrics so you can measure over time, a little bit like the company, so you can measure over time, is it getting better or worse, and where are we? I think that would be also be a big help. But I mean, it's easy to be pessimistic, but like the Chinese say, the, the best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago, but the second best time is, is, is now. What else can we do to <laughs> fulfill our mission? Sorry, Judge Luther. Um, I didn't notice, I mean, it touches on all of these things, but um, with respect to the criminal justice system, and brain health, um, it doesn't look like there's much research in that area. And I also will just throw out, I know just from one perspective, in Dallas County alone, in the Dallas County Jail, it costs us $11 million a month to house 6,600 uh, people who are just awaiting trial here in Dallas County, most of them with some mental health issues. Yeah, so I think, I mean, we have uh, a database of brainomics related articles, many topics. There's probably 700 brainomics articles that we've, you know, and books that we've come up with over the last few months. I don't recall there being one that looks at the brain health, combines brain health economics, criminal justice, these sorts of costs on that. So I don't think there's been much research, but you know, you and I have discussed if you could have some meaningful impact on uh, incarceration rate then you're going to have a huge economic benefit as well. I mean, it's, it's the largest cost to the county of Dallas. Pe did people hear that? The largest cost to the county of Dallas is incarcerating the inmates in the county jail. Andrew, can I be a message of hope given the prior two questions? We are actually working on starting a study that one of our PhDs is looking to do exactly that, is to start to study the impact of better brain health on, on those metrics. 
Also, we have to remember the Center for Brain Health is right here in Texas. And what we have heard from our constituents, we were just in DC, this has the tenor of one of the most apolitical movements from a policy standpoint as anything that's out there. It's hard for either side of the aisle to take a position against better brain health. Why? It helps every constituency. So this is, we're trying to leverage that and make Texas, instead of a maybe misperceived state that doesn't care about education, to actually drill in and take a more focused effort and actually lead the nation in what's going to transform education. So here's, we have some online questions. Oh, okay. Yeah, the first question, how would removing cell phones from K through 12 classrooms improve successful learning by reducing the major distractions by social media that damage and weaponize brainomics? All right, so I will ask a neuroscientist to answer that question. I, I just do the economics of it. Sandy, do you want to? Well, I think we clearly know it's not our cell phones that are uh, bad. It's us and the way we allow constant use of it that's keeping us building an ADHD brain and a brain that can't think innovatively and deeply. So absolutely, removing cell phones could help the way our brain can focus and concentrate and create new solutions to things because the distractions build a distracted brain. So, yeah. And there's another question. What, what can we do as advocates for the great findings that the Center for Brain Health is advancing to help support and promote your work in the field of brainomics? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you for that question. So I, what would be really helpful to me is if people who are advocates who know the Center for Brain Health obviously talked about everything the Center for Brain Health does, but also talked about brainomics with people they meet and find people who are interested who can come back to, to us, call us up and say, we heard about brainomics come and talk to us about it, and then you know, we'll see, we're trying to build out the case for it uh, company by company, for example. You know, can we engage with you? Can we do uh, some training and some experiment? Can we measure it? So you know, talk, to everyone want, is in this day interested in brain health, interested in the concept. So the advocates for the Center for Brain Health, the more that you can talk about it and say, we're ready at the Center for Brain Health to engage with any, any leaders that want to talk about brain health in their community and you know, we have the intervention programs and now we're going to have the brainomics built into them. So please talk and if people are interested, send them to us and we will engage with them. One more? Okay. Um, any observations regarding artificial intelligence slash robots and how this relates or will relate to brainomics? Right. So I think that this, this highlights, I mentioned before, a little bit of geopolitical rivalry and uh, I think that the, my view on the AI is it makes it more, from an economic viewpoint, it makes it more important to have brain health, to have a, a productive economy, because you need higher order skills in order to be productive when AI can do so much. So the need for the advantage for brain health within a company, competitive environment, or between nations is heightened in an environment where AI is so critical. That's the, that's the official brainomics viewpoint. Great talks. So I'm kind of thinking from a more global perspective. Can you tell me if we've considered yet the difference between American or more capitalistic or individual kind of culture countries versus, say, Asian countries where they have a more uh, socialist or a more collective perspective, the impact on brainomics? Well, uh, let, me, let me just speak personally from someone. Who, I, won't, I won't speak on behalf of brainomics for the next 30 seconds uh, on that. Um, What's very interesting to me, I mean, I went to China the first time in 1983, so before most people here were, were born. I went, um, I lived there for 10 years. Uh, I've lived in Africa for 10 years. My, my wife is of Indian descent, so I'm connected to India uh, on that. Um, and what is very interesting to me, and Prof Sandy mentioned, I've, I kind of came into this from the viewpoint of flourishing. It turns out that China and India are very low on flourishing. And I was really just, I wasn't surprised that China was so low on flourishing because you know, I've lived there and, and, and it isn't, this, it isn't where I would want to live. Um, and I, I was quite surprised that India was so low on flourishing because its economy is doing quite well, it's rising up in the world, and yet its flourishing is even lower 
then, uh, I mean, I think to put some numbers, don't quote me, but I think the, the flourishing metric in India is like 17%. In the United States, it's between 50 and 60% on that. Um, so I, I don't want to couch this in terms of capitalism versus socialism. But what I would couch it in, which I think fits in with the, the, the neuroscience that I've learned, um, is that there, it's very critical to have a healthy brain that you have a sense of agency on that. And I mentioned before in one of the bulletins, we'll talk about the economic impacts of having a self of sense of agency. And it's just, it just living in China, the sense of agency is lower. And so therefore, it's you know, more difficult to get. And I think in the longer term, the system where you have a sense of agency is really critical for, for success. And I'll, I will say that I've come to Texas, and you know, I think people here who are from Texas are aware that in the outside world, there's negative views of Texas. I mean, I can't tell you the number of people. I mean, I, I won't compare the number of people that said you're crazy going, when I was going to Nigeria to the number of people that said you're crazy when I was going to Texas. <laughs> but, but people were very negative. Uh, and yet I've come here, and I have a very positive viewpoint. It's not just because of the role I play. I mean, it's because of the warm welcome that we had. That, but it's particularly because of the sense of agency in this in this part of the world. The Texans can do things, and you can go on your own path and set your own path. So I think as it unfolds at a geopolitical level, um, I just think that the model, the, let's not call it even the economic model, the human model for China, and as I said, I went there for more than 40 years ago, the human model for China, and now disturbingly the human model for India is, um, uh, it's, it's, it's got challenges, and I think the main dimension is because of the sense of agency. Now, if I had to compare it to Africa, I won't speak, Africa is 54 countries, it's a big place, but I will speak for Nigeria uh, on there. I mean, Nigeria is actually quite interesting. I don't know the, I mean, it has very challenged economically and corruption, but it has a high sense of agency. People feel like they can, you know, do things within there, they have a high, high degree of autonomy. Um, on there. So I actually think, I don't know the flourishing number, but you would actually, and of course there's this quote, Nigerians are the happiest people in the world. So, so if you, you think about it, I mean, people tend to have a viewpoint that money equates to you know, happiness or flourishing, but in fact the relationship is much more complex than that. So Nigeria's flourishing is greater than the economy would suggest. South America's flourishing is greater than the economy suggests, particularly in South America because of connectedness. Whereas Eastern Europe's uh, flourishing is lower than you'd expect because of you know, other historical issues. So it's all very interesting. But if I was going to sum it up in one word, I'm happy to be in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> one last question. So I'm glad that you mentioned about flourishing and money. And as an economist, um, I'm almost always thinking that the measurements always boil down to money because happiness will be related to how much did it cost, or absenteeism, how much hours, and then money. I was wondering, as a visionary and as an economist, is there, do you have confidence that in the future maybe your measure of your brain health may be a uni as universal, at least, as the measure of money? <coughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> And I think, I, you know, I think, I mean, I think the, even, even where we are at, people understand once you get over an income of $60,000, the relationship between the increased income and happiness or flourishing is, is not very strong. Um, I, I think that people, I think within a decade, and this will be the same, you know, Texas will be the center of this, everyone will be thinking about their brain health as, you know, the same way they think about their blood pressure or other metrics or their uh, glucose levels. Uh, on that, and I think, and of course, once you're thinking about your brain health, you're going to do things about your brain health. Ten thousand steps, for example, on that. And I think people, and I also, I can tell you, you know, at my age, when I meet with people my age, you know, most people I meet with have enough resources. They're not talking about money. They're talking about their health. They're talking about their purpose. They're talking about their connectedness. So all of the dimensions of the brain health that the center has developed over the over the decades are in fact what matters to people on that. So, so it'll be a sign of progress if people put their income you know, below their brain health score and their connectedness score on that. And, but I think it's coming. Hi, um, thanks for your talk. I also, I started as an economics major and switched to uh, neuroscience. Oh, uh, I think my interest I'm in neuroscience so jealous. Is, the same, <laughs> is the same as yours and uh, improving you know, social health. Um, you spoke on how Meta and other technology companies exploit advancements in neuroscience to capture the attention of users. 
Um, I study attention and reward and a similar phenomena. Do you see a risk and perhaps an ethical risk in, in using the same kinds of circuitry and like exploiting the same findings in like gamifying learning the way Duolingo does or like um, gam gamifying productivity, making people addicted to work and things like that? Is there a caution being taken around that? I, I think that's a very good question. I think that's a very good question. I mean, let, let's be honest, the, 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 business, the people who run businesses are fantastic neuroscientists. I mean, they were great neuroscientists before the term neuroscience was invented, right? Mm. Uh, I mean, you go back 50 years ago, people thought putting 399 was you know, useful on, on prices, right? That's, that's kind of neuroscience. And they just got more and more sophisticated. And I don't, you're probably too young to remember, but about 20 years ago, they came up with this behavioral economics. Mm. Behavioral economics sounds so benign, but again, it's, it was just the, the beginning of trying to use neuroscience to manipulate, influence or manipulate people to, for certain commercial purposes. Of course, we sit here at the Center for, for Brain Health and we say we, you know, we're not, not for profit, we're scientifically driven, we're trying to improve people's lives. You know, so the programs that we, we put out have that intention and it's a little bit like an arms race. I mean, the, the people that run, I won't name any companies anymore, but people run their companies trying to use neuroscience for profit, are, are, their arms keep spiraling up. And hopefully people like us that are trying to use neuroscience for good are also spiring up with our, our, our weaponry. But it's a very good ethical question. How do we know that we're kind of on the side of the angels? And I think that's something maybe that we need to talk about. So. I think he's going to answer it. He's, a, he's become a neuroscientist. We're going to get him to the task. Dr. Nevin, thank you so much for such a mind-stretching every single one of us. I want to know how much value would you put on your better brain health versus your paycheck? Oh, no, maybe not then. No. <laughs> no, but thank you so much. It was so riveting. Very well done. Very well done. We hope that each of you will join us December 8th uh, for our last of this year. Dr. Holly Bowen, Assistant Professor of Psychology at SMU, will talk about motivated memory in old age. Motivated memory. Motivated Brain Health, thank you for motivating us to put a value on our brain health. Thank you so much.